Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today with two-time Olympic coach and former head coach for the University of Calgary, Shawnee Harley, presenting her topic titled, Don't Blame the Lettuce, Grow the Gartner. Shawnee Harley is the founder of Dynamic Coaching Solutions, holds a master's degree in coaching studies, and has more than 25 years of coaching and leadership experience, including corporate work across the country and high performance sport at the Olympic Games and World Championships. Her vast experience in the elite world of sports transfers directly to the business world where success is talent oriented and people driven. Shawnee brings her world-class coaching portfolio and a unique approach to equip leaders with the tools to propel themselves to winning results. And with that, I will hand this over to Shawnee. Okay, people, let's do this. Let's plant our garden. I'm hoping everybody can see the screen and I'm hoping I can know how to go to the next slide. Yeah, look at that. How look. So the goal of the session today is to help us figure out what in the world does lettuce have to do with coaching? What does planting a garden have to do with basketball or any other sport that you might work with? Well, this is something that I hear a lot. No one ever uses, no one ever says, Hey, Shawnee, the problem is my lettuce isn't growing. But what they do say to me is, how come my team isn't performing? How come my athletes aren't getting better? Or how come some are and some aren't? Um, you know, coaches will often say to me, using the lettuce analogy, how come my lettuce isn't as brilliant as someone else's lettuce? How come my lettuce is growing more slowly than someone else's? Well, I think there are three parts to the problem. Do you think the problem is the lettuce? So coaches say often, my lettuce, they just can't grow. Or my lettuce is so stubborn, it doesn't grow. What I propose, I just think lettuce grows. I think it can grow and I think it wants to grow. And I want us to think about as coaches, if some of our lettuce is growing, is that the fault of the lettuce? Do, does somebody show up for your team and say, you know what, I don't wanna learn anything. I want to be completely disempowered. I wanna feel crappy about myself. I don't care if we win or lose. I don't care if I get playing time. I don't think any athlete shows up with the intent to not grow. So what about the gardener? Is the gardener part of the problem? Does the gardener lack the skill? Maybe you're an average gardener. Maybe you haven't taken the right gardening classes. Maybe you have, but your awareness is low. You're just not paying attention. You're not thinking about what you're thinking about. Therefore, your self-awareness is low. And the third part of the equation is, what about the environment? We know that soil, water, and fertilizer helps let us grow. What about the soil, the water, and the fertilizer with your team and with your athletes? I'm going to give you three things to think about. What's your why, your what, and your how? Because if we're going to grow the gardener, we have to be intentional. Like it's useless if I just say, you know what, Gardner, just go grow yourself. Go read some books, go watch some YouTube videos, go take some coaching courses there, done. That's how you grow. There is so much more to it. You know, this is what we call the art of coaching. The art of coaching is much, much harder than the science of coaching. So hopefully I'm gonna give you a little art on how to grow amazing lettuce. Start with your why. As we get ready to do these next few slides, what I would encourage you to do is have a pen and paper handy, or you can type it into your phone or on your device. Uh, feel free to use the chat, you know, to put your answers in the chat. Actually, I really like the chat option 
because we have an amazing opportunity to learn from each other. I know some things, but I sure as heck don't know everything. So I'm encouraging you to put some of your answers in the chat box. I want you to write down why you coach. Just short and sweet point form. I'm not marking it. I don't have my red pen out. We're not posting it on social media, but if you would write it down, why do you coach? I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to do that. Go ahead, please. I have no idea if that was 30 or 30 seconds or not. I actually felt a little short, but that's okay. We're moving. Here's an example of why. I think that's a pretty good why. So if I were if I were going to give that if I were if I'm the judge, if I'm the judge of your why, and I'm scoring that on a scale of 10, I would give that, I think I'd give that about a, I'm saying a seven. Canadian judge, 7.5. Here's what's missing. When we think about why we want to coach, I think that's great. One of the things we don't do is we don't think about what kind of lettuce do you want to grow? We just think, well, I want to give back to the game. I want to create great people. That's way too vague, in my opinion. Here are some examples. You know what? Like, I want to grow, I want to grow leadership lettuce. I want to grow uh, lettuce that knows how to lead itself. I want to grow teamwork lettuce. I sure as heck don't want to grow selfish lettuce. I want to know lettuce, grow lettuce that knows how to work with each other. What about empathy? You know, do we ever talk about the importance of empathy in something that we want to grow in our athletes? We talk a lot about, uh, people talk about hard work. I love the word grit. I just think it encompasses so many great qualities. What if your lettuce had grit? Oh my gosh, what would that look like? What if your lettuce had integrity? Do we talk about integrity when we are growing our athletes? I think, imagine integrity for later in life. Integrity is such a critical, critical characteristic. Do we ever talk about that with our athletes? I'd like you to write down two things that you want to grow with your lettuce. Just two, feel free to put them in the uh, chat box. I can see some, uh, Somebody's written in there in the chat, chat box. I can't see your name, but um, thank you who's ever in there. And Lou, I don't know if this matters, but it shows that the chat's coming only to the organizers and panelists. I don't even know what that means. I think that means we're the only ones that can see it. That's what I thought. Is that what we want? Doesn't matter. <laughs> You're the organizer. I have to stay in my lane and just tell people how to grow lettuce. All right, so Good, thank, you for, thank you for knowing your role. <laughs> say it again. What did you say? I said, thank you for knowing your role. Jeez, look at me. Role accepted. My goodness, <laughs> get in someone else's garden. All right, I'm hoping you wrote down uh, two things for your lettuce. <clears throat> so that means we have to connect the why and the what. So look at this one. Like that's, so I'm going back to my scale of 10, like if I was the judge of people's why, and I read that, I'm like, whoever that coach is, I wouldn't even care what sport he or she was coaching. I would want my son or daughter to go and play for that coach. That's the kind of leader I would like to work for later on in life. I want you to look at the clarity around what 
kind of lettuce that coach wants to grow. Look at that words, empathy, integrity, lead, responsible, change. That to me is real clarity on why we coach because now it includes the kind of lettuce that we want to grow. Well, how about the how? How do you grow lettuce? The way I look at it, there are three things that you do. You have a culture, you have practices and training sessions, and you have games and competitions. So your culture would include all of your team building things, all of your road trips, your traveling, all of that thing that you do outside the court. Team meetings, parent meetings, practice and training sessions are self-explanatory as are games and competitions. But this is a question I really want you to ask yourself. Does your how connect to why and what you're doing with your lettuce? People will say to me, well, here's, a, here's our culture. And I'm like, yeah, that's your what? How is it growing your athletes? And by the way, you have culture, whether you think you do or not. Culture is either accepted or it's intentionally built. People say, well, you know, culture just take, we no, it takes care of itself. I'm like, oh, right. Therefore, that means you just accept. You just accept whatever behaviors show up. You have a culture, whether you think you do or not, the same way that no name brand is still a brand. How do your practices grow your athletes? And how about your games and your competitions? Are they growing your athletes to connect with the why and the what? Does, is your how equivalent of the why and what? The reason I asked that question, I'm out in gyms a lot and I watch a lot of basketball, obviously it's my, it's my favorite sport. I see a real disconnect overall between the why, the what, and the how. So let's look at what makes lettuce wilt. Starting with culture, I want you to write down one thing that you do and somebody else that you might know. What's one thing that you know you do in your culture that makes lettuce wilt? What's an action you take or what's an action that you do not take? What are things that you talk about with your team or you don't talk about? What's allowed, what's not allowed? Write down one thing that makes lettuce wilt with regard to culture. One thing you do, one thing they do. I'm pausing to give you a moment to do that. Let's look at the opposite. What fertilizes the lettuce? What fertilizes, what waters your athletes? This for sure is absolutely critical to intentionally build a culture. Remember I said you have one, whether you think you do or not, it's either accepted or it's built. When we build it, if we are true to our why, we must build it together, coaches and athletes, and it has to connect. It has to connect to why you're doing this. It has to connect to what kind of lettuce you're trying to grow. I think this is one of the reasons, including the truth, why culture is one of the most difficult pieces for coaches to work with, because really, who likes the truth? Right? No one wants to hear it. Very few of us want to speak it. What I encourage is your culture needs to include things that build and things that break. Simple example, mean girls. Mean girls breaks culture. Cliques break culture. 
cutting each other down make, breaks culture. And yet I see it a lot. I see it a lot in teams. I see how they interact with each other. And I'm sitting there thinking, why is that? Why is that allowed? I'm like, oh yes, it's because they haven't intentionally built the culture. So we just allow whatever behaviors show up and then we reward and we pay attention to the behaviors that we really like. And then the ones that we don't like that much, we avoid them, we sweep them under the carpet. We say, oh, they'll figure it out. Your culture must include the truth. The truth about how we're going to behave, how we're going to act, what words we can use, and most importantly, what breaks culture. You need to identify it. What is it okay to do and what is it not okay to do or say? And make commitments. Has your team committed to your culture if you have one? And how do you know? How do you know they are committed? And to what? To what parts of the culture has your team committed to? I would also ask you, what about the coaches? Are the coaches committed to the culture? Do the coaches, are they the role models for the culture? And here's why nobody likes culture. Because if you're going to do it, if you're going to make a commitment, what is the point of a commitment if there is no accountability for it? How do you hold each other accountable? Have you talked about that when you're building your culture? What, what are you going to do when someone breaks culture? You know it's going to happen. It might happen with your staff. It might happen with you. It will certainly happen with players. What are you going to do to hold each other accountable? Have you talked about that as a team? Next one, practices and training. I want you to write down one thing that you do, one thing that you've seen someone else do in practices that you know makes the lettuce wilt. Go ahead, please. I'm going to pause. I want you to write down one thing. Well, what fertilizes the lettuce? We know for sure that small-sided games fertilizes lettuce. If you're not exactly sure what that means, if you go and you Google small-sided games for basketball, go onto YouTube, there is some fantastic information. There are YouTube videos, there are diagrams, but we know for sure that small-sided games helps grow our players better than full court five-on-five -five scrimmages. What about a point of emphasis? I was just doing this uh, webinar for Alberta Lacrosse a couple of weeks ago. And so I said to the coaches, I said, how many things are you working on in any given drill? And they're like, well, you know, let's, let's use basketball. We're, we're working on, this is a rebounding drill. And I'm like, so if it's a rebounding drill, why are you talking to them about shooting? Why are you talking to them about their lousy defense? And where I'm going with this, we can only process a small amount of information at any one time, particularly if we're new to the game and we're still learning the game. My suggestion is you, whatever drill you have, whatever you're working on, come up with a maximum of three. And I think that's too many for younger ages. I would go with one or two. What is the point of emphasis for the drill? And that's the only thing that you are error detecting and correcting. I was doing, I mentioned I did this webinar with Alberta Lacrosse and coaches would be like, well, if we're only looking at one or two things, what do we do about all of the other things that are going on? And I'm like, close your eyes, stop looking, stop watching the other things. 
whatever it is that those other things aren't going well, then go make a drill and work on those other things. We overload our players. We're watching far too many things. You, you, you think about a learning environment. We can only learn so many things in a given period of time. If any of you are golfers or you've played golf, have you heard about golf? Think about standing on the tee box with five swing thoughts. What happens to your drive most of the time? Well, it's not going to turn out very well with five swing thoughts. So points of emphasis, get them focused, get you focused. Let the other stuff that's ugly, let it be ugly. Any of you familiar with uh, Trevor Reagan and his concept of train ugly? We don't do a very good job with that. We want it to be pretty. We want it to look amazing. And I'm saying, close your eyes. Don't look at the ugly. Pay attention to one or two important things for that particular drill. What else fertilizes lettuce? Well, we know that healthy competition certainly fertilizes it. We know that unhealthy competition doesn't. So here would be some examples. So first of all, think about how awful it is to lose all the time. So every time we have a competition, inherently that says there's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser in the typical way that we do it. There's going to be a winner, there's going to be a loser. How could we do it differently? Have you ever thought about using, I'm using golf again, where you give strokes to players, just like you do in golf, right? You wouldn't have somebody with a, a two handicap and then there's somebody with a 30 handicap and they play head to head out on the golf course. The person with the 30 handicap would get a million strokes. I don't know how many a million is, but it would be a lot. How do you make competition healthy for all of your lettuce? Because you know who likes competition the most? The people that win. Well, duh, the people that win are the ones that like it. Your best players who score all the points and always on the winning team, they're the ones that love any kind of competition. And so my question for you is, what are you doing for the rest of your lettuce? How often do your players get to compete against themselves? You know, what was my best self today in relation to yesterday? We're gonna do these two drills. We're gonna do them back to back days. How do I know if I got better today in that drill compared to yesterday in that drill? This is a big one. The safety to mess up, the safety to take risks. Coaches tell me all the time, you know what, Shawnee, I want, I just want my players to be creative. I want them to have great basketball IQ. I want them to be able to create and read and react. I'm like, awesome, me too. And then I go and watch, and what I see is fear. Fear means when I get out into a drill or I get, get on the court in a game, the number one thing that I'm doing is trying not to mess up. That's the number one thing. Therefore, I'm not going to take risks. I'm not going to try my new move. I'm not going to do something uncomfortable because I don't feel safe to do so. Because if I mess up, it's going to come with a consequence. This just popped into my head. I was thinking that, you know, it's interesting. We as coaches, what we, what we really kind of do is we manipulate behavior with reward and punishment. We manipulate behavior with reward and punishment. When you mess up, I yell at you, I correct you, I make you run lines. I sub you out, I belittle you, I talk too much about your mistake. The opposite happens when you do something amazing, I cheer, I reward you with playing time, I put you on the starting lineup. What I want you to, to see is for your best players that might work okay, but what about the rest of the group? I want you to think about 
Does punishment wilt or fertilize lettuce? Does punishment wilt or fertilize your athletes? What about a do-over? What about saying, you know what? We are not afraid of mistakes because mistakes are what help us grow. Mistakes, if we pay attention, our mistakes can actually provide information. What do I need to do better? What should I have done differently? Well, you know what? Give them a do-over and let them discover that. The best way to learn is right there in the moment with what I did or did not do. What about a do-over? Right then and there. Would that grow your lettuce better than reward or punishment? Because our goal is to help them learn. We cannot learn in a culture of fear. This means, you know, I'm pausing because I'm, you can't see my face, but I'm shaking my head to myself here. I wish we could be more creative with something other than who put the ball in the basket the most number of times, right? So with a score, if you think about all the things that lead up to being successful as a team, so at, at the end of the game, the scoreboard worked in your favor. What are all of those things that have to happen? So I'm talking about the process rather than the result. Coaches tell me all the time how important rebounding is. And then I will go and watch an entire hour and a half practice. And I never see one single reward for rebounding. None. Zero. I see them do a rebounding drill where everyone practices their little boxing out thing which by the way, very often doesn't transfer as soon as you go live, because how often do I hear coaches yelling, box out? I'm like, wow, you sure yelled out a lot. I wonder if you're not working on that in your practice. And they're like, oh yeah, I do, I do box out drills. I'm like, well, you might want to think of something different because I don't see it transferring to the game. So what are we doing to reward the process? How do we reward you know, if, if, you're, if you believe in forcing baseline, as an example, do you reward on-ball defenders when they actually do a good job of that? I've never heard or seen that rewarded in a practice. I just see the focus is constantly on who's scoring points. So what is it that you believe is important for your team to have success on that scoreboard at the end of the day? And how will you reward that process? This is one coaches don't like very much when I talk about this. So I asked them, okay, so why are you coaching? What kind of lettuce do you want to grow? We want to grow, we talk, they talk a lot about leaders, right? We talk a lot about, we want to grow confidence in our players. And I'm like, well, how is that going to happen in a dictatorship? Because coaching is very much a dictatorship. I tell you what to do. And then when you do it the way I want you to do it, I reward you. And when you don't do it the way that I, do, that I want you to do it, I punish you or I blame you or I yell at you or I don't give you playing time. When was the last time we gave our athletes an opportunity to lead? What does that mean? How often do your athletes get to talk in practice? How often do you ever ask them their opinion? How often do you ask them a question? How often do you give them an opportunity in practice to have a timeout where you're not involved? You have to stay on the sideline. Do you teach them what leadership looks like? Do you teach them how to lead or do you just have it in your why you coach? Well, I want to build confidence. Next topic of, of wilting lettuce. What happens in our games and competitions? Please write down one thing that you know that you do and one thing you've seen someone else do. What happens in games and competitions that makes lettuce wilt? Well, 
well, what about fertilizing our lettuce? How do we do it better? You know who really likes games and competitions? The best players. And I'm not opposed to that. I mean, if you even look at the name of my business, the subtitle is Winning Matters. I love winning. I'll sign up for winning any day of the week. But what I want us to look at is what is our definition of winning? If it's only working for a small percentage of our team, are we an effective gardener? If only some of our lettuce grows, are we an effective gardener? Have you ever talked with your team about the definition of success? Because the way sport works, we only know how to define it one way and it's called a scoreboard. You either won or you lost. You had more points than the other team or you didn't. I know that you understand how narrow that definition is. So what would it look like with your team? Have you ever asked them their opinion? If we're trying to grow them as leaders, as people, if we're trying to give them confidence, they need to be involved in the process. This was huge. How do you come up with playing time? Who decides? Is it always the same? Do you ever change it? Do players get input or is it based on reward and punishment? The best players get the most playing time and the worst players get the least. The reason that I mention this, here's something else I think that we need to, to pay attention to. I hear coaches telling their players, you know what? We really like players that hustle, like players that dive on the floor, players that really work hard and give their all. And then I go and watch and I look at games and I'm like, well, I bet there are players sitting on the bench thinking, you know what? My coach is full of crap. My coach told me that hard work and a good attitude is going to give me playing time. And here I am sitting on the bench again. My suggestion is you really need to get clarity. You really need to be open. You need to put your cards on the table. How are we going to keep our athletes involved? How are we going to keep them growing? Because it's really hard to grow when you sit on the bench the entire time and then you're expected to be the best cheerleader. You know what? That's Screw that. If I was a bench player after a while, I'd be like, you know what? I'm so sick and tired of cheering for the starters. And you know how we all do that little things. One of the starters comes off. Everyone stands up to bow down. That's how it feels to me. You know, stand up and I have to give them a high five. And half the time the starters give me a little, you know, wilty, a little wilty, if they're mad, they don't even they don't even do it properly. I'm like, those, how are we doing that? Why can't we do that better? What's a different way that we could do playing time? How could we help all of our lettuce grow? It brings me into starting lineup, and I'm gonna put some of these things together. Players, for players, the start, starting and having your name announced and running out there and smacking hands with everybody and standing at the jump circle seems to be the most important thing. And you know what, if I, as a coach, I'd be like, awesome. That means policy on my team, we're going to change the starting lineup. Every single game, we're changing the starting lineup. Because seriously, the first two or three minutes of a game, you can start anybody. What really matters is who's finishing. We know that, especially close games or they're, they're won and lost kind of in the last two to three minutes. How do we, why can't we change the starting lineup? Why can't we let other people go out there and grow for a couple of minutes? Have you ever thought about doing this with playing time? 
I did this one year uh, when I was coaching dinos. I had a really had a group that was very athletic, and I had a group that wasn't as athletic. And I divided them into two teams of six, and we platoon sub. And the first group went in, and we pressed. We pressed full court, and we ran, and we tried to shove the ball down your throat as fast as we could, get up as many shots as possible, and then press and trap. And then I would sub, we would sub every three to four minutes. And the next group came in and they played two, three zone. And they played, we played, this was in U Sport, which I'm hoping some of you are not playing zone, the younger, your younger levels. But I brought a less athletic group in and we just played a different style. And I found a way to get playing time for all of the lettuce in a way that suited them. And I just bring this up because I think that our current model of sport, we are losing athletes. For those of you that coach females, they drop out of sport at a rate six times that of boys. We are losing our female athletes because sitting on the bench is not fun. I'm coming back to how do we help our let us grow. I'm just going to pause for a sec. Hey, Lou, I'm wondering if your microphone is on because I can hear background noise. No, I'm muted. You're muted. Okay, that's fine. We will continue. Some other ideas for you for what fertilizes lettuce. When a player comes out of the game and sits down on the bench, we what I see is we do a couple of things. One of them is nothing, so we don't do anything. They just go to the bench and have a drink and figure something out. We, we go down and we error detect and correct. Usually we just error detect and sometimes we forget to correct. Have you ever thought about asking for their input? I mean, they're the ones out on the court. Why can't we ask them, you know, how's that feeling out there? How are we doing? What suggestions do you have? If we want to build leaders, we have to find a way to let them lead. We have to find a way for their voice to be heard. I mentioned this uh, in practices, but I'm coming back to, oh, hang on, I just thought of this, I have to back up. Do we ever go and sit down on the bench, so let's so the starters are in, and then there's the bench players. Do you ever go and sit down in the middle of them? Be, be, say there's a player on your right, a player on your left, and say, I want you to watch for the next two minutes, and I want you to give me one, one thing that you've seen as you've been watching. How do we get input? input? Because you know what? The reality is we have players that spend a lot of time watching the game because they're not on the floor. They're watching. How can we grow them? How can they feel empowered? All right, I'm back to here. Again, we're back to rewarding the process. The scoreboard is a very narrow way of figuring out if we're growing lettuce. What are the things that you're charting? What are the things that you're tracking? There has to be a way for players on your team to know they're getting better even if they never score a basket for the entire season. They have, to, they have to have proof and evidence that they are growing. And I want you to think about what are you doing with that? How do you know if your lettuce is growing? What would you do if there was no scoreboard? Like, isn't that an interesting question? If there was no scoreboard, you have no idea, and that, and you're not allowed to cheat and have a parent in the stands keep track of the score. What if their basketball just didn't even know what it meant to keep score? So if there was no scoreboard, what would you reward? How would you know if your team was having success or not? If there was no scoreboard, what would you work on in practice? Because Coaches tell me all the time, yeah, I'm not about winning. 
I like to win, but that's not my main focus. Winning is not the main focus around here. And then I'm like, well, why are you spending most of your time working on your offense then? Let them lead. If you give them an opportunity to lead in practice, they will know how to lead in games. What's happening in the player huddles? You know, when there's a sub, there's free throws, and teams are huddling and talking, have you practiced that? Do they know what they should be talking about? Do they know how to fertilize their teammates themselves? What happens when you call a timeout? Who talks? Last time I checked, the only person that's talking is the coach. How can you teach them to lead? How about when you call a timeout, why don't you spend some time talking with your assistants? And if you don't have an assistant, talk to yourself in your head. Or better yet, in that 15 seconds, Teach your team how to talk and you stand and listen. How can, isn't that ideally if your lettuce kind of knew how to grow itself because it had been fertilized, it had been watered, it had been given sunshine. And then your lettuce is like, oh yeah, it's game time people. We got this, I know what to do. How do we grow that? We cannot do it by being the dictator. We cannot do it by being the one that talks all the time and gives all the opinions and then manipulates behavior with, with reward and punishment. That's an important title. It's a huge responsibility, by the way. If anyone thinks they're gonna put their hand up and volunteer to coach, I'm like, oh, put your hand down. Put your hand down until you have done some serious thinking and some serious self-reflecting. Because if you think growing lettuce is easy, all you have to do is pour a couple sprinkles of water. Uh-uh, this is not easy. If it was easy, everyone would already be good at it. I believe the game belongs to the athletes. And I believe we need to give it back to them. I think we've taken it. I think the coaches have taken it and I think the parents have taken it. The rightful ownership belongs to the athletes. We know that sports should be for the benefit of the athletes, but I want you to self-reflect and I want you to think about when you've watched other coaches coach, do you know what it looks like when it seems like a coach is coaching for their own benefit, for their own ego, for them to look good? It should be for the benefit of the athletes. The only way that we can truly do this is we have to lean out because if we lean out, they get to lean in. Our athletes cannot step up unless we step back. How do we expect them to have any air time when we are taking all of it, when our presence takes up all of the space? Who leans out at halftime as a coach? Last time I checked, nobody. So the way I see it is practices seem to belong to the coach Games belong to the coach. Timeouts belong to the coach. Halftime belongs to the coach. Post game belongs to the coach. I think that is contradictory to growing lettuce. We started with the problem is my lettuce isn't growing or it isn't growing fast enough. It's not growing bright enough. Can we take some time to self-reflect? Say, how can I do this better? How can I become a better gardener? 
my first suggestion is to really get clarity, to really, really examine why you coach and then to go deeper. What is the lettuce that I want to grow? And ask yourself, do my actions match my purpose? I said I want to grow lettuce that have good teamwork, that are good people, that have integrity. Do my practice sessions reflect that? How I manage games, does it reflect that? How I manage myself, does it reflect my desire to grow my athletes? Your how must connect to your purpose. Your what and your why, I'm asking you to go back and get clarity and then say, how can I do it better? How can I do it better? How can we grow more lettuce? How can we make sport something that all 12 players, if it's basketball, that all 12 players are finding a way to grow? How can we stop losing so many female athletes? Because it isn't fun. They don't like it. It's not enjoyable. There is a huge cost when we lose athletes, male or female. It's up to the gardener to find ways to keep them. I have two more slides for you. And here's something that I would ask you to consider. I really think that what I love about this quote is I mentioned to you, I'm, I watch a lot of sport and I'm telling you, I, forward thinking coaches, they are just finding ways to grow their athletes. They are the overachieving teams. You know what that looks like. You've played against teams where you know for sure you have more talent and the other team wins. What is that? How do we grow that lettuce? How do we get our lettuce to grow in such a way that it overachieves? It grows greener and bigger and brighter than it should. I'll leave you with this last thought from everything that I've talked about today. What would you be willing to stop? So what are you doing currently that wilts your lettuce? What are you currently doing that does not connect to why you coach and what characteristics you're trying to grow in your athletes? And then ask yourself, what would you be willing to start doing? And you know what, I, I, this just popped into my mind. In fact, I'm gonna, I, it's a, what I like about the thought I just had. So that says stop, start, continue. You know what I'm gonna switch that to? Stop, start, commit. Hang on, I have to write that down. That was a good one. Stop, start, commit. Commit to saying, here's what I'm going to stop doing. Here's what I'm going to start doing. I'm going to stop wilting lettuce. I'm going to start fertilizing it. Here's my commitment. And here is how I'm going to be held accountable. That's all I got for today. I'm hoping you I've given I'm hoping I've given you some ways that you can think about being a better gardener, how to grow it, how to fertilize it, how to water it, how to stop wilting it. I think I'm going back to Lou and I am so ready for your questions, your comments and your challenges. Anything you didn't like, anything that you liked, anything that you want to poke anything that I can help or give an opinion on, let her rip. Go ahead, Lou, it's yours. Okay, so I've taken note throughout here within the chat and some of the questions. 
Um, so just going back, some of the comments regarding some things that people responded to your question about one thing that wilts. So I just want to read some of those off and share them. Um, sometimes I speak too long and my players lose focus. Yelling in the faces of youth. Subs after each mistake. Bullying. And negative body language, body or verbal. So one question related to those things, Shawnee, is how important is it to ask your athletes what wilts them? You know, one of the things that I've learned, I do, um, I do mental toughness coaching with athletes and it has been the most amazing experience for me because I have, I've been able to look at it through a different set of glasses because I've ended up being the learner instead of the teacher. And I've learned a lot by asking questions. And I'll tell you one of the things that I've learned, the lettuce is 10 times smarter than you can imagine. The youngest client that I work with is 10 years old and I work with clients all the way up to, uh, so a 10 year old hockey player, all the way up to uh, professional LPGA golfers. So think about the range of athletes that I work with. And what I would say is, we don't give them nearly enough credit for how much they know. Therefore, I think we don't spend enough time asking questions, asking for their opinion, asking them to discuss something in a group. What if you ask your athletes, what are two things that fertilizes you? And what are two things that will you? Or one. What's one thing that I do that fertilizes you? What's one thing that I do that, that wilts you? You can use, certainly you don't have to use the uh, lettuce analogy. Have we ever asked our athlete that question? I also want to talk about, you know, we said bullying, yelling in the face of athletes, subbing people out after a mistake. What I also find interesting is as coaches, we get away with behavior that would never, ever, ever be allowed in any other context. Could you imagine a grade five teacher and somebody's doing timetables and they gave the wrong answer and we went and yelled at them? Are you five times five is not 16. Get on the line, go run. Could you imagine if we did this in an educational set at our schools? Could you imagine if you did this at work? Like HR would be all over it. We get away with behaviors that are not acceptable in any other context. And I will tell you, they are so destructive because they create a culture of fear. Nobody, nobody grows in a culture of fear. I'm ready for the next one, Lou. Okay, so these two are related. How do I balance negativity and constructive criticism? And related to that, can you discuss the difference between punishment and accountability? Hmm. Okay, I might forget the second one while I'm asked, answering the first one. So you might have to cue okay. me again. I actually, no I forgot the first one. I forgot the first one. How, how, do I, how do I balance negativity and constructive criticism? Right. You know what I love? I just love that question. Here's, and you know what? Again, when you raised your hand to be a coach, remember I said this earlier, put your hand down. Like, what were you thinking when you raised your hand to coach? This is so freaking hard. This is the art of coaching. It's so difficult. All right, so here's, here's my answer to um, criticism, constructive feedback, error correction, uh, error detection, correction, whatever you want to call it. So this is this is what I'm 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 learning now, and I'm working with 
in my corporate coaching that I do and the athletes that I work with. And by the way, I did none of this when I was coaching for real. I, I didn't know any of this. Let's just take the concept of feedback because that's what we're doing. You did something that I didn't like or it was wrong or it wasn't the right thing. And then I correct you or I yell at you or any of the above. I want us to think about what, how do we learn as people? So if every time I make a mistake, you tell me how to fix it, that's like the lecture. We know that um, when students sit at university in lecture halls full of 150, 200 people, and they sit there for an hour and write notes while the professor lectures, we know that, that uh, learning does not improve as quickly as small group work, uh, discovery learning, et cetera. What I believe works with feedback, no, I'm gonna tell you this. Here's my definition of feedback. When feedback is done well and it changes behavior is this. When I do feedback well, I put up a mirror so that you can see yourself better. I provide a mirror so you can see yourself better. Because what are we trying to do? Are we trying to create robots or are we trying to create independent thinkers? What if I could, when you made a mistake, I could put a mirror up and say, let's just say you missed a shot. Where did that shot miss? There's only four ways. It can only miss front, back, right, or left. Where did that shot miss? Instead of saying, you know what you missed, you really need to follow through better. Your follow through was crooked. It was off to the side. You need to follow through down to the middle. You need to put your fingers in the cookie jar. That's what we normally do. What if you said, where, do you, where did that shot miss? They're, they will probably say, I don't know. And then you say, great, go take another shot and pay attention to what happens with the miss. How can we put a mirror up so that our athletes can see themselves better? So where I'm going with this is, how can I change myself if I don't know what I'm doing wrong, if I don't know what I look like, or if the only way that I change is I follow what my coach tells me to do and then I become their robot. Not only do I become their robot, I become their prisoner. That means that I don't have the freedom to think for myself. I don't have the freedom to be creative and I will always be afraid of disappointing my coach. The best way to change behavior in your athletes is to ask questions because, because when I ask questions, now I cause you to self-reflect. That's how learning begins. When I self-reflect and go, hmm, I missed that shot. I wonder why. Well, that's interesting. Now I can be curious. I can be curious about my mistakes. What we do with it, we don't, to me, it isn't even feedback. To me, it's like, it's like the little bird sitting in the nest. The little bird is hungry. The little bird opens its mouth and the mom comes and force feeds it. That's what we do. We force feed our athletes. Like open your mouth, here it comes, whether you like it or not. This isn't what, I'm hoping that's not your why. I'm hoping the kind of lettuce that you're trying to grow is independent thinkers, empowered athletes. We talk, confidence comes up a lot. I wanna give my athletes confidence. Well, you wanna give your athletes confidence, teach them how to be self-aware, teach them how to self-correct, teach them how to be a detective. What is a detective? A, te a detective looks for clues to solve the mystery. Okay, Lou, I'm gonna pause there because I could go for a long time on that one. So give me the second question again, please. Okay, can you discuss the difference between punishment and accountability? Ooh, I love it. Well, I guess this is what I, here's what I think. And you know what, here's listeners, this is what I want you to remember. Everything I'm giving you right now is an opinion. I'm not Oprah. You know, I, I don't have my own YouTube channel. You know, I haven't written a book. 
I know some things. I don't know everything. So when somebody gives you an opinion, which is what I'm doing right now, it doesn't mean it's gospel. You don't have to listen to me the same way you might listen to Oprah. But here's my opinion on punishment. I'm just completely against it. I used it all of the time when I was coaching because it worked. But damn, there was a cost. The cost was I disempowered my athletes and I created fear. And any time we have fear, I cannot be creative because I'm too afraid to come out from behind myself. I will hide. Anytime I'm afraid of punishment, I will hide. So then the question was about accountability. And here's my thoughts on accountability. Have you ever brought your athletes into the equation and asked them to say, what if you said to your, your athletes, I want you, I want every athlete today to pick one thing that you want me to hold, hold you accountable for. And then the athlete comes up and says, coach, I, I, my, my commitment is I'm going to go to the old boards. Every time the shot goes up, I'm going to the old boards and I want you to hold me accountable for that. When I do, when I work with teams, whether it's sports teams or corporate teams, I tell people, you can't hold somebody accountable to something they have not committed to. Because then it's just important to you. If it's not important to them, why the heck are they gonna do it? The only reason they're gonna do it is to avoid getting in trouble. And now we're back to the culture of fear. I believe that accountability works best when I've stated my commitment to whatever it is. I'm going to do this and I want you to hold me accountable. Why can't we use teammates for that? The coach can't watch everything. Some of you, you're the only coach in the gym for heaven's sakes. And you're gonna be saying, Shawnee, your ideas are great, but I need a staff of 15. Well, you have 12 players and we're trying to create leaders. We're trying to create independent thinkers. We're trying to help them get better at teamwork. I believe that accountability works best when I've made a commitment and I have given you permission to hold me accountable. We think that we have the right to hold our players accountable to everything because we think it's important. Think about all the things that we try to hold them accountable to do. How many times do you correct athletes? How many times do you yell? How many times do you stop a drill? How many times do you pull them off the floor? And the, when I watch the dynamic going on, I'm like, yeah, that's disempowering that, because that's a dictatorship. That athlete has no choice and no say in the equation. I'm pausing again, ne ready for the next one, Lou. Okay, um, regarding culture, one coach commented that they don't host enough team building activities and that not every kid buys into the culture. You spoke about intentionally building culture together. And so um, we're wondering how do you suggest that coaches do this? Do coaches specifically outline behaviors? And how do you hold yourself and your athletes accountable to these behaviors? When, you know, a lot of coaches tell me that they don't have time to build culture. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's because your why is winning. You have lots of time to practice. If you don't have time to build a culture, then take a whole practice. Your first practice of the year, you should be in the locker room building culture. That's how you find time. And if you didn't finish it on the first day, then you continue it. Because if you don't find time for culture, you've said it's not important. My suggestion is you do some small group work. You divide them into you know three, three or four small groups. And we talk about what behaviors build. And if you, you don't even have to use the word culture, you can say team chemistry. You can talk about unity. 
You can say the words trust and get them to come up with what builds trust, what builds unity, what builds team chemistry. And then you will prob them, probe them and prod them along the way. So being on time, does that matter? Building each other up and giving compliments, does that matter? Keeping the locker room clean, does that matter? What about when we talk about each other behind our back? Does that build or break culture? Is it okay to be late? Is it okay to pout on the bench? I would suggest you keep it pretty succinct and pretty compact, especially if your team is young. And then the next piece is, how are you gonna get commitment to that culture? Did they just say it because they felt like they had to? That's part of the culture discussion. Are we willing to commit to what we just agreed to, to these build and these break behaviors? And the reason that you'll know if they, build, if they bought in or not, you now then get them to say, what are we going to do when somebody breaks the commitment? And then come up with it, ask them, how are we going to hold each other accountable? If somebody's pouting on the bench, what will we do about that? If there's a clique on road trips, what will we do about that? Get them to come up with it. That's how you build a great culture. It should be player led. And the coach, the coach shouldn't be driving that. The coach is just the co-pilot. The coach is the GPS, but the players need to decide it. The reason players don't buy in is because the coach set it. The coach said, this is what we're going to do. It's really hard to get buy-in when you dictate what the culture should be. Next one, Lou. Uh, a related question to that. How do I engage my athletes in asking questions and get their honest answers versus them saying what they think I want to hear? Yeah. That's such a good one, because what I would say is the problem's not the athlete. I would like the coach to ask themselves to do the self-reflecting and say, what am I doing or not doing that's creating fear here? Why, is this, why does this athlete not feel that they can be truthful and authentic? Remember, we're always afraid of punishment. And punishment, think about how big that word is. One of the biggest, I'll tell you, I mentioned to you that I do uh, mental toughness coaching for athletes. And I've worked with hundreds of athletes over the last few years and they, they do these mental toughness tutorials and then they have to fill out worksheets. The worksheets are the best part. They are so enlightening. Uh, lesson number two is called Tame Your Fear. And one of the things that I've learned when I read their worksheets, the number one thing that athletes are afraid of is the fear of disapproval. The number one thing athletes are afraid of is the fear of disapproval. So when an athlete is not willing to be truthful with you, go to the root of it. They're afraid I'm not gonna like them. They're afraid it's going to affect their playing time. And so I think it's really valuable as a coach to say, what am I doing that's causing or growing that fear? And what kind of conversation could I have with this athlete to fertilize them instead of wilt them? And I mentioned this earlier. Why wouldn't you say to your athlete, what's one thing that I do that fertilizes you? And what's one thing that I do that wilts you? And then stop wilting and start fertilizing. How do I become less afraid of my coach? How do I stop being their prisoner with fear of disapproval? Well, when they stop wilting me, I don't, I'm not as afraid. When we have a culture, so the term I'm going to use, if you've, you may or may not have heard it before, the, cult, the word is, the phrase is psychological safety. Psychological safety says it is safe in this team, in this environment to be myself. It is safe in this environment to be myself. That means my awkward self, my embarrassed self, my scared self, my confident self. I feel safe to be myself. 
there's a reason why we don't do that because sport is revealing sport is so revealing in fact you know they say sport builds character i'm like yeah but sport reveals it sport makes you stand naked i mean you make a mistake think about how many people are watching you you say the wrong answer to your coach the coach is right there looking at you so how do we create an environment of psychological safety where it's okay to mess up. It's okay to not know the right answer. It's okay to take risks. It's okay to be myself. Again, coaches ask me all the time, you know, my players don't do this. My players don't do that. And I'm like, oh, I see you're blaming the lettuce. Last time I checked, lettuce wants to grow. How can you help it grow better? Next, Lou. Okay. With respect to rewarding process, can you give some examples of how you reward process? I sure can. I'm going to go back to um, the example I gave of boxing out, and I'll, I'll give us another one after that. But this one just comes to mind because I did this for years as a coach because I know that. Um, I think there was a stat, this is just a sidebar, that at the end of the game, the team with the most rebounds wins 80% of the time. So I heard that stat long, long ago. And so I'm like, wow, that's a big, that's a big stat. That's important. So we're going to work on rebounding. And we would do box out drills a lot. And then we'd go into another drill that was live where the goal, where the focus wasn't boxing out and nobody ever boxed out. And I would get so uh, ticked off. I was going to say another word, but I'm going to say so ticked off. I'm like, seriously. And I'm, this would be, I'm telling my team, we just spent 12 minutes in a box out drill. Would someone like to box out? And if that didn't work, then I made them run. You know, when I look back on what I, I'm like, wow, I sure did not know how to grow lettuce. Then I finally got a little smarter and I talked to my staff one day and I said, I'm never going to ever, ever again. I'm never doing a box out drill ever, 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 ever. I'm never, ever going to do a box out drill again for the rest of my coaching career because it doesn't work. It doesn't transfer. And it just makes me mad when they don't box out. So here's what we did instead. We started doing every drill that was competitive. I said every uh, hoops, here's an example. So this is a U sport team. So you can have to adapt it for your group. Every basket is worth one and open O boards are worth three. We're playing a game to seven win by two. Well, what I learned from that was we became really good at boxing out because the offense started crashing the boards like crazy because the reward was holy cows like three points if i get an old board and the harder they went to the old boards the better boxer outers we became because if you didn't box out look at what happened you just gave up three points to your team to the other team so that would be an example of rewarding process. If you believe that rebounding is important, then re reward all boards. If you believe that um, on-ball defense is important, then here's what I would say. I, so I would figure out what was important and then I would reward the opposite. So if I thought boxing out was important, I would reward offensive rebounding. If I thought um, on-ball defense was important, then I would say this. If the dribbler gets into the paint, offense gets three points. Everything else is worth one. So you can see that if I forced, not forced, well, I guess it was forced. If I could encourage, <laughs> 
that's a good word. If I could encourage the dribbler to get into the paint and hunt the paint with the ball, I just got thinking about, wow, that's really going to improve our on-ball defense. So that's how I did it. What do I find important? And I'm going to reward the opposite. Boxing out is important, reward old boards. On-ball defense is important, reward the offense when they can get the ball into the paint. If transition defense is important, then reward it when a team can score a layup in transition in three passes. Those are all simple ways of finding something that matters that you know if we do these things well, it will serve us when the buzzer goes after 40 minutes and then find little ways to reward it. Here's another one. Here, this bugs me so much. Coaches are talking all of the time. They're getting so mad. Yeah, my, my team doesn't talk. My team doesn't talk. I'm like, that's interesting. And then I ask them, well, what are they supposed to talk about? What are they supposed to say? Because isn't it interesting that we never let our players talk ever? And then we get so mad when they don't talk on defense. I'm like, that is so contradictory. We only want them to talk when it's convenient for us, when we want them to talk. I'm thinking if you think talking is important, that isn't even close to enough clarity because you can talk and it's meaningless. Blah, 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 blah. Deny, 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 deny. I'm not a fan of that. That's talking for the, for the sake of talking. So again, get clarity on what's the purpose of the talking? What problem is it solving? And if it's not solving a problem, why do they have to talk? And if talking is important, you better find, I encourage you to find ways to let them talk, let them contribute in something other than blah, 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 blah. Deny, 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 deny. Help, 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 help. Reward process and make it meaningful to you, but more important, meaningful to them. Perfect. Okay, one comment during the presentation was, quote, give the game back to the athletes. Now that's a quote, I'll be using from now on. I love that, says one coach. So a related question to that. One of the more difficult things to manage are different agendas of parents of the elite players versus those of the players who are not quite as strong. For instance, winning versus development. How do you navigate that minefield? Such a great question. You know, and I did touch on it early in the slides. I think it's really important that there's clarity around the definition of winning. And I think that that definition needs to, that's part of building your culture, that you define what is important to your team, to all of your team. And that needs to be shared with the parents, that this is what we came up with in our team culture building session. This is how we are going to define winning because remember the way parents the parents only have two ways no nope, three ways of defining could be more these three just popped into my head three ways of defining winning the scoreboard how much playing time their child got and how many points their child scored the only way you have a chance of changing that mentality is in a parent meeting and having a parent meeting, that should be part of your culture and being able to talk to parents about build and break. Like why are parents not held accountable to the culture? Maybe you wanna bring your parents in on your culture building session where they sit in the back and they're observers and they're listeners and they watch you build the culture with your athletes. Until you help parents see that your definition as a team is more than the scoreboard 
It's more than how many minutes I got, and it's more than how many points I scored. You cannot, you cannot bridge that gap. Educating your parents on a definition of success. And you know, you talk about, is this development or winning? I'm like, it's both. Because if we're winning and I'm not developing my best players because we're just better than everybody, then so what if we're winning? How do I develop all of my players? How do all of our players get to experience winning? And if the only way they experience winning is by a scoreboard or playing time, we're in big trouble. We will continue to lose our athletes, particularly girls, because when you say, well, you just have to work hard and have a good attitude, that's bull. Coaches never live up to that. And so you might have some players on the bench that are so hungry to figure out their definition of winning, and all they're doing is sitting there wilting. Getting clarity on your definition of winning what are we doing with playing time and what are we doing with the starting lineup? I had that on an earlier slide, absolutely critical in your culture building and absolutely critical to share that in your parent meeting at the beginning of the season. And if you don't have time for a parent meeting, that means that you have time for practicing your offense and you don't have time for a parent meeting, then have a parent meeting during a practice, cancel practice and have a parent meeting because this stuff, this culture piece, when not done well, it's the biggest thing that wilts lettuce and blows up your team chemistry. Okay, and last question. Yep. What, what does it take for coaches to hold up the mirror and have an honest look at their themselves and their behaviors? and how that might be contributing to the mass drop, dropout rates with our youth. Yeah, that's a good one. You know, coaches, what I'll tell you is that, you know, I've been coaching for most of my life and I didn't even know what this meant till probably five years ago. And it reminds me of a quote my grandpa used to tell me when I was young, he would say, so soon old, so late smart. And when I was young, I'm like, oh, grandpa, what does that even mean? That's not silly. And now that I'm older, old, older and old, I'm like, damn, that was insightful. I didn't get smart till really, really late in my career because I didn't know how. Nobody had told me how. So I just did what I'd always done. I coached the way that I was coached. Now that I have a better understanding that when the lettuce is wilting, the first place what we have to look is in the mirror. And I never did that. When lettuce was wilting, I'm like, come on, you damn lettuce. Smart enough. Get in, run more lines, get fitter, make more shots, grow yourself. I did such a poor job of being a gardener that nurtured. I was very poor at learning when to push and when to pull. I pushed all the time. I never pulled. Once you've taken and listened to this webinar, the best thing is that it takes us out of unconscious incompetence. So unconscious incompetence says, I don't know what I don't know. So if I don't know that I'm wilting lettuce, there's no way I can stop wilting the lettuce. I'm hoping that this webinar has taken you out of unconscious incompetence and taking you to conscious competence means now I know. Maya Angelou says, when I know better, I do better. I didn't know better for most of my coaching career. It isn't that hard to put the mirror up, but I didn't know I was supposed to. I thought that yelling, punishing, I thought that was a really good way to grow lettuce because I was involved in elite sport and my job was to win. 
All I want you to do is watch your players. Your players, if you will pay attention and tune in, your players will show you where you need to look in the mirror because I know for sure you know what wilting looks like. You know it. You know what a disempowered athlete looks like. You know what a disempowered athlete feels like. You know what athletes are needy. You know what needy feels like. You know what a confident athlete looks like. We know this. Intuitively, we know it and we feel it. Why do we ignore it? Why do we not pay attention to what we're doing to wilt the lettuce? So how do you look in the mirror? Watch your athletes. Listen. We have two ears and one mouth for a reason. We should be listening twice as much as we're talking. If you pay attention, your garden will tell you what it needs. Your lettuce will show you where it needs some water, where the soil needs to be changed, where we need to add some fertilizer. Here's why it's hard. It doesn't feel very damn good to look in the mirror and go, oh my goodness. I am the cause of this lettuce wilting. I'm the reason that players are quitting. I'm the reason that people are sitting on the bench pouting because we never talked about it in our culture because we didn't build a culture. We just accepted it. Looking in the mirror is one of the most humbling, not one of the most, the most humbling things I ever did as a coach. And I did it really, really late in my career. And it's hard to do. And that's why we don't do it. It's easier to blame the lettuce. Shawnee, thank you. That was a good finishing line, Lou. That was <laughs> fantastic. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It's easier to put this <laughs> to coaches. Flip it. If it is to be, it's up to me. It's the gardener's responsibility. We can do this better. I know we can. What will you stop? What will you start? And what will you commit? Now I'm done. Thank you so much for that thought provoking presentation. Thank you to everybody who participated today. Shawnee, I have people uh, saying thank you. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I loved watching your C uh, U of C practices. This was awesome. Can we have this presentation? Um, I just want to say thank you on behalf of Ontario Basketball for your time and sharing your wisdom through this honest, thought-provoking presentation. Thanks, so, everybody. And listeners, hang on, Lou. I'm going to send a PDF a version. I'll send it to Lou, and she can figure out what she wants to do with it. But either way, my point being, I'm, I will share this presentation but not until I fix the last slide. I'm taking continue out of the last slide and I'm putting commit. That's all I got, people. Go grow your garden. Thank you, Shawnee.